crazy busy. These days, busyness has become a status symbol. Researchers at Columbia and Harvard found that about 12% of humble brags by celebrities on Twitter were about being busy. Then they created a fictional Facebook user. When she posted about working nonstop, people thought she had higher status and more money than if she posted about her leisure time. The researchers also found that people were even impressed by products aimed at busy people, like a grocery delivery service or a Bluetooth headset. And while we complain or humble brag about having too much to do, we might be doing it on purpose. Previous research at the University of Chicago found that people actually prefer being busy. And the researchers found that people wanted to keep busy even if it actually hurt their productivity. For example, they might respond to non-urgent email instead of finishing a big project. They even came up with a term for it, idleness aversion. But that may be an American phenomenon. The researchers at Harvard and Columbia tried similar research with Italians, and the results flipped. Italians considered people with more leisure time to have higher status than those who were working all the time. So next time you're feeling crazy busy, think about whether whatever you're busy doing is really accomplishing your goals. And if all else fails, you could always move to Italy. Welcome to this gathering of Journey and Perfect Faith Community. My name is Becca and I'm a journeyer. You are welcome here in this virtual gathering no matter your politics, your background or beliefs, your skin color, your sexuality, your nationality, the state you're in, what you struggle with, what joy you have around. You are God's beloved. Wherever you are and whoever you are in this moment, you are welcome here. I invite you today to consider how you can give financially to Journey and its work in the world. We give away 10% of the money that comes in to people in need and causes that advance our missions of compassion, justice, and spirit. If you have any questions about Journey, please go to our website, journeyifc.com. Today we are continuing our series called Rise Up with a gathering called Be. We live in a busy, loud, complicated world. We are connected to supercomputers and all of human experience and knowledge contained in our hands and ears and living rooms. We are busy, we are tired, and we are overwhelmed. The news is disturbing and we feel fear and concern, but there is also hope. There is possibility. Where do we find it? By going not outward, but inward. What we are hungry for, we already have. You will find it in quiet and listening and being still. God is waiting. I ask you to stop wherever you are. Relax. Open your hands, your mind, and your heart. Let's breathe for a moment, opening ourselves to the presence of God's loving presence. Again, welcome to this gathering. Amen. Lord, Lord. Open unto me. Open unto me. Light for my darkness. Open unto me. Courage for my fear. Open unto me hope for my despair. Open unto me peace. 
for my turmoil. Open unto me joy for my sorrow. Open unto me strength for my weakness. Open unto me wisdom for my confusion. Open unto me forgiveness for my sins. Open unto me tenderness for my toughness. Open unto me love for my hates. Open unto me thyself for myself. Lord, Lord, open unto me. of doing God's will is an interior habit of uh, emptying, detachment, or becoming nothing. I think that centering prayer really includes any effort at interior silence in the presence of God that evokes our more and more of our total surrender to that presence. People could say, well, if you let God do it, nothing will happen. On the contrary, I think if you let God do it, everything will happen. So if you want to save your life, you will bring yourself to ruin. But anyone who brings himself or herself to nothing will find out who they are. The spiritual life is all about doing what we all have to do anyway at death, but doing it sooner because it will enable our actions to be much more effective. It's receiving the compassion of divine mercy and letting it flow uh, onto others. You could call it just say surrendering to love if you prefer. And that's all we have to do ultimately, accept his love. Let us uh, allow ourselves to be loved unconditionally and so be inspired to meet the real needs of everyone in the human family past present and to come This is Rob.
Bob. I'm a journeyer coming to you from Seattle. A reading today from the passage of Jesus' teachings from the Gospel of Matthew. So here we go. Jesus told them, Be careful. When you do good things, be careful not to parade your righteous deeds in front of people to be seen by them. If you do that, you will have no spiritual reward. And when you give to the poor, don't be like the religious people. They make announcements and want recognition. Their reward is praise from people, but it's hollow where God is concerned. The thing you are looking for is spiritual, not physical. And when you pray, don't be like the religious people. They stand up in church or in public and say impressive prayers so that people will notice them. Don't use big words and fancy phrases. That's what impresses people, but that's all you'll accomplish. Instead, when you pray, focus on God, not on people. Go into an inner room, someplace private within yourself, and be with your heavenly parent. God cannot be seen. God is known in private in stillness, and there you will find what you're looking for. This guy, this God here, your Christ? I have to believe that God is present to them. Now that's hearing them. God cares about them, but the evidence is not that God is a problem solver that God rushes in to do whatever we, out of our very often false self, ask God to do. So yes, God is present to me. I do believe God cares about me. And in that sense, you know, I think it's in Luke's Gospel where it says, uh, do you think any of you would pray and God would not give you the Holy Spirit? What? In other words, the answer to every prayer is the same. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's not maybe healing grandma right away. But if there is an influx of spirit, then God has answered the prayer. Now, I do realize that that takes a little more mature consciousness to to recognize it. Because we like to live, the ego likes to live in a functional, tit-for-tat, problem-solving kind of world. So uh, often uh, some people don't find that answer satisfying. Actually, if they can be with it a little while, I think they'll find it's very satisfying. Did you say be with it for a while? What do you mean by a while? Like five minutes or when will we okay. While, that sounds like a commitment. <laughs> well, it, not a knee-jerk reaction. All right, a knee-jerk reaction is almost always an ego reaction. So to stay with it, to hold its problems, to hold its contradictions. Now that might be five weeks in the big, or five months, and it might be five minutes. And I bet we've all had those five minute experiences. Okay, pull your ego back a little bit. What's going on here? He's really not trying to hurt me. What did he really say? You know, that kind of thing. And a, a normally mature person can do that, pull back, a little bit from his own hurt to frame it in a bigger way. We can, we can surrender before the sabotage? Uh, uh, at least I would hope so. Yeah, it, it isn't common in our culture because we live in a strobe light uh, culture where we don't give ourselves time to surrender, I think. What does that work mean to you? I have to admit, the first connotation, even as much as I've studied and been taught, I have to admit, I'm still an American, and the word surrender first connotes weakness, giving up, losing. It still connotes that for me. And I'd be lying if I said any different. So, uh, I suppose it's only in the, the dance of love where you learn to understand it, where maybe you've given up to your partner and, and let her lead or let her guide or let her teach or let her love in the way she wants to love. And first of all, it does feel like a letting go, doesn't it? It feels like a, a giving up, a losing. I'm letting her have her way again, you know? <laughs> uh, 
And it's only the effects afterward that tell you, you know, this wasn't all losing, it was also finding. favorite things to talk about in the whole wide world is Hamlet. Part of it's because I was a college English teacher for 10 years before going into the ministry 25 years ago. Part of it is because um, as an English teacher, I used to think a lot about my students who were college age and older. They were, uh, I taught at uh, open enrollment uh, community colleges and prisons and uh, high school concurrent with college courses. And um, I had this wide variety of students. And I remember when I went into teaching thinking, do I really care whether my students know about what a comma splice is or um, what a synecdoche is or all this other very technical stuff in English? And I realized over time, especially with teaching inmates in prison and what they taught me, that what we really needed to learn was how to think, how to read, how to reason, and how to get at the truth within ourselves and the world around us. East Texas is a much more conservative part of the world than uh, Austin, where I've lived for almost 20 years. But um, uh, uh, that didn't mean that people weren't thinking critically, of course, right? Especially young people or people who were hungry and trying to figure something out. And so I loved teaching um, works of literature that were uh, problematic or that pushed at us or, or, or that uh, gave students something to chew on. And there were lots of things like that, Greek mythology, um, great uh, rhetorical pieces where somebody like E.B. White um, wrote an essay that just took a long time to think about and to digest and to argue about. Um, and one of my very favorite things to teach was Hamlet. Here's the thing with Hamlet. This is a guy who is in a lot of pain and he's trying to figure out what to do with his pain. And he wants revenge because his uncle, his brother's father, has killed his father. And his uncle who killed his father, Hamlet's father, married Hamlet's mother. Hamlet's a college kid. He was away at school when this happened and comes home for his father's funeral or depending on how you read the play after his father's funeral and is there for his mother and uncle's wedding. He's in a lot of pain. Uh, he's privileged. He's uh, a royal. He's got plenty but he feels empty and bankrupt. And at one point, some people are saying something about, um, wow, this is a beautiful place where we live. you live here in Elsinore. And he says, it's a prison. And they say, what? It's, it's, I don't think it is. And he says, well, there's any, nothing that's good or bad except that thinking makes it so. Everything is what it is because I think it is or because you think it is. And he says, so I say it's a prison. Hamlet has to go through the process in the play of figuring out what he wants to do about this dilemma that he has, which is he's angry at his mother for remarrying so quickly and for remarrying her hus dead husband's brother. And he's angry at his father's brother, who is now the king. And he's angry that he would have been king, but his uncle jumped in ahead of him. And he's angry that he's not at college and he's angry that he doesn't know whether to take revenge or to just give up and go back to school. I say all this as an example of the fact that we live in a time that is uh, angry. We're angry. We feel uh, lots and lots of things as a culture and I can't speak for what you feel, but 2020 was a year in which there was a lot of suffering and a lot of things were 
um, to also quote Hamlet, out of joint. The uprising of people to say that Black Lives Matter and that we have a problem with systemic ancient racism, as I think I've mentioned, one of the scholars that I like says that um, America's original sin is racism. That everything in America's uh, problematic uh, issues over time is related to how white Northern Europeans uh, uh, systemically, consciously and unconsciously uh, marginalized or eliminated people who were not their color or even their religion, even white Europeans who were Roman Catholic instead of Protestant, Puritan, etc. So that has made us angry, both those of us who feel defensive and those of us who feel like these issues have to be put forward because it's necessary for us as a culture to deal with them in a healthy way or else we won't get better, we won't get healthier. And we're angry about the pandemic and we're angry about people dying, hundreds of thousands of people dying, hundreds of thousands of families. We're angry about who's gonna get the vaccine, who's gonna get the whatever. We're angry about um, the president, people who like the president, people who don't like the president, uh, today is Sunday the, as the 17th. This coming Wednesday, there will be an inauguration of a new president. I hope it goes smoothly and not violently. But there is violence bubbling up in all of us. I say all that to say that we are living in a time just like Jesus' time. Jesus' people were angry. They were Jewish people who were living in a country that was ostensibly Jewish, but was really run by a client king of Rome and the Roman Empire. And it was really just not at all Israel, but a Roman province in the North Galilee and the South Judea. These are people who, uh, most of Jesus's people were poor, working class people, who would love for the minimum wage to have been raised. There was no minimum wage. At one point, as you know, you've heard Jesus talk about this. If somebody sues you for your cloak, give them your shirt. Landowners and wealthy people who owned property and owned the sharecropping families who lived on the property, property that had been taken from those families and uh, reappropriated by Rome or by Rome's puppets and Rome's uh, elites who had been basically given the land of the poor people as rewards. Those people could sue a tenant or a worker for everything that they had, including their outer garment, their cloak. That's what it felt like to those people to be that oppressed and some of them were zealots who wanted to drive out Rome and drive out any Jewish leader, Jewish elite who um, sympathized with Rome. The people who ran the temple in Jerusalem were sympathizers with Rome or compromisers because they said the best way to preserve our nation and our religion is to appease this gigantic empire and keep them reluctant to wipe us out. That didn't work forever. The Romans finally so pissed off and just over it with the Jewish leadership and the Jewish people uh, in 70 uh, CE, 40 years or so after Jesus' death, execution and death and resurrection, we can throw that in, uh, destroy the city of Jerusalem. These are people who are living in difficult times where big issues are being argued over and there is violence and there is violence against those on the margins and the outside and there is violence against those who don't fit in. Emotional violence, physical violence, economic violence. All of those things have had created this pressure cooker in which people would come and speak and teach some of those people were just called 
teachers, rabbis. Some of those people were called prophets. Jesus is a rabbi who is also called a prophet because he doesn't just, just, just teach about how to be Jewish. He also teaches about what God is going to do when God makes all things new and God brings the great and terrible day of the Lord. The great and terrible day of the Lord is when God will make things right again. And so Jesus keeps having these uh, moments where he teaches his people about what God wants the world to look like. And they think that it's a political solution. They think that driving the Romans out and having a new king, driving the Romans out of the temple and purifying the temple and having God's purest Jewish people be in charge of religion will fix everything. And Jesus never talks about that. He never talks about politics except to say that politics is about policy and the policy is about caring for the poor, the widow, the orphan, the nobody, including the stranger, the scum, the sinners, which Christianity is terrible at. It just is. There are pockets of Christianity, it seems to me, in which the whole purpose that people have in their mission is to care for the leftovers, the outsiders, the poor, the marginalized. And one of the things that I'm most proud about regarding Journey and Perfect Faith Community is that it's been a place for its entire existence where the leftovers and the people who don't fit into religion and the people who don't know what they believe and the people who have been rejected by church or other bodies and institutions that say, this is who you have to be, this is what you have to believe, etc. They've been driven out of those or they feel uh, unwanted and they've come to Journey and Journey has welcomed them and affirmed them and included them. Jesus says, here's the solution to this anger and this problem that we have. It's not to get more swords and it's not to get more uh, uh, um, mechanisms for social change. It's not to come up with a system. It's not to come up with a new candidate. He says, what you have to do is go within. All of this that you're hungry for comes from an inside job in here. That's the only place it can come from is within. And if you're going to pray this prayer, as we talked about earlier in 2020, this beautiful prayer that's called the Lord's Prayer, if you want to pray this prayer, God, come and bring your kingdom. Help me know how to do that. Help me know how to help. Help me to forgive others and let go of my resentments against others and myself. Help me to just trust that you'll give me what I need every day. He says the way to get to that is to go within. Your big prayers in front of people are useless. They're a problem. Your big religious ceremonies, your big demonstrations, your big uh, uh, shows of your goodness, your power, your prayers to God or to whatever, all of the stuff that you're doing to show us all what you got. He says it's all in the way. And none of that is going to get you what you are hungry for, because what you are hungry for can only be found within. He says, if what you do is demonstrate in front of people and make the big show, and I'm doing this and this and this and this and this, then that's your reward. That's what you're going to get. That's what you're going to reap. That's what you're going to harvest. And we are kind of like that, aren't we, as human beings? I want, how many likes can I get? How many likes did I get? At some level sort of becomes, am I good? Am I worthy? Did I do a, am I, do I have value as a person? Jesus says, if that's what you're going for, then that's the reward you're going to get. But there is something much better than that, much deeper than that. And he uses this beautiful image, this strange metaphor go into an inner room and that's where you will find god last week i suggested in our worship gathering suggested that one place to find god is in working with other people connecting to other people to be present and to do what needs to be done but i want to back up now and simply say 
But Jesus also says, be quiet. Just be quiet. That what you are looking for will be found in the quiet. And then you'll be then you'll be ready to pray this prayer. God, how can I help you establish this thing that you dream about in the world? How to be quiet? It's not that complicated. You saw the explanation of, or the, or the overview of contemplative prayer earlier with Father Thomas Keating. It's not hard to find a prayer method or tools. We've used lots of different kinds of prayers over the years at Journey. The trick is not the tool. The tool is just a way in. The point is to go in. And maybe the inner room is a closet in your house. More than likely, your inner place, your inner room is in here and in here. Amidst all of the hubbub of all of the things that all of our culture has chosen to process and deal with and the things that we are struggling with as a culture in good ways. It's important. It is important to enter this unrest and to say, who are we as a people? What is our role in getting rid of and healing racism and hatred and bigotry? And what do we do about the inherent violence in our story as a people and what do we do about caring for the poor and what do we do now that we're having a new administration and new policies and so on and so on and so on. Those are important things, right? And yet Jesus said, when somebody said, so here is a coin, do I give it to Caesar? Do I give it to the world, to the government, to the powers that be, or do I give it to God here in the temple? And Jesus says, well, who does it belong to? The coin is not the point. You're the point. Where are you getting what you need in order to become what you dream of becoming? Because there's nothing that is good or bad except that thinking makes it so. And the place to go is in here to find the place to be quiet where God is. Jesus says, your parent is waiting for you in secret in the quiet that's where you'll find what you are really hungry for. Have your opinions changed in your life? Have your beliefs changed? Have, has your politics changed? None of those things is what lasts. Not one of those things will last. What will last is in here and in here and in your tummy, in your bones in this deep place within you where God waits to meet you. This week, have some quiet. Maybe watch a little less news. Maybe spend a little less time on social media. Maybe invest in meeting God in the quiet, in the quiet place. Just be, just be, just be. and the tears of others, the tears of hundreds of thousands, suffering, grieving, crying out to God in anger, in exile, in injustice. Water. We think of the waters, rivers, streams, oceans, the passages, the boundaries, the markers of journeys and thresholds, the nourishment the clouds give to earth, and we think of those who thirst for goodness, for God, for hope. Bread. We celebrate that God is with us in our bodies, in our sleeping and waking, in our working and resting, in our serving and learning. We trust that what our elder brother Jesus told us is true. 
God is with us always, feeding us, watching over us, providing for us. Honey, apples, fruit. We taste what is in front of us. We take our time. We choose to find what is sweet in the midst of dryness and deserts and to celebrate it and to share it with others. We feel the communion between our hearts, our bodies, and God's spirit. Dip your finger into the salt and taste it. Taste the tears. Eat a bite of bread. Remember, God is providing for your needs. Drink a sip of water. Feel the refreshing and the thirst quenching presence of God's goodness. Eat a bite of fruit dipped in honey. Celebrate the sweetness in the midst of the desert. God, we thank you for being with us and for being at work in the world, in our illness and our death, in our unrest and injustice and violence. You bring light and healing. We rise up in joy, in tears. We feel you restoring us and giving us strength so that the world will be nourished and strengthened through us by our being in it. 